Is it okay. do we exist on there now? Yeah, I see some avatars and a, a comment. Okay. Let's see here. You see one comment? I do. I uh, early. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, cool. This is um very exciting. Um so I've already said this to you, Marissa, but this is our first time doing a live session Q&A. And it's both very exciting and also very nerve wracking because technology is like beyond me. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's become very hard for all of us to navigate. To figure out, you know, it's like, but this is cool because now everyone gets to watch us talk to each other and like pet you, they get to watch you pet a cat. I know, I'm loving this right now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this is the She Shreds live session, and I'm here with Marissa Paternoster of the Screaming Females. Um, we are coincidentally both in Portland, Oregon, and Maine. Respectively. Um, and we're going to try and understand each other through this situation. So... If you guys have questions, please comment on this little situation. And after I ask my questions, we'll get to some of yours. Um, but so you're in Portland, Maine. Are you like on tour? Or are you chilling? What are you <laughs> up to? We're on tour. Uh, we're on tour with a band from Philadelphia called. <laughs> Sorry, there's there's gonna be some cat interruptions. <laughs> Yeah, based interruptions. Uh, we're on tour with a band called Tears from Philadelphia and another band called Bow from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, I think this is maybe the fifth show or sixth show, not sixth show. Uh, and um, yeah, we are playing tonight at the Space Gallery. Uh, we played there a bunch of times, so and it's always it's always been a, a real hoot. Um, we love Portland, Maine, so it should be another another nice night, evening for us. What is also, like, uh, FYI, the cat is rubbing his face on the side of the computer as cats. <laughs> so if there's a little wiggling, there's no earthquake or anything. Or if you see like a whisker. I just, feel like cats just find the most inconvenient time to like be extremely aggressive about getting pet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty much always down to pet. So... Um, so Okay, so you've been on tour um, a lot. I've been seeing a lot of people wondering about, like, how do you, like, stay healthy on tour or, like, keep yourself sort of, um, you know, like, fresh and not hating the world and your body not hating yourself? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, staying healthy on tour is uh, – can be difficult because uh, you, you keep weird hours and some people's bodies really don't like that. Um, but I would say that like, you know, the same kind of stuff you do at home is like everything in moderation, doing your best to get enough sleep. Um, I mean, if you have to take a nap, do it. I highly recommend it. Sleeping is very healing. I probably do too much of it though. Uh, trying not to eat too much garbage, um, which can be hard when you're just traveling on the highway. Um, and you know, you know, don't get too, don't, don't have too many drinks. Like maybe say no to the last drink. Uh, but you, you know, still what? Oh yeah. Go to planet fitness. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the, we went to planet, we go to planet fitness. Uh, well, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to shout out their brand or whatever, but I will say that we really do enjoy, um, going there together as, as a fam uh so you work out basically like yeah we we uh you can work out but you can also see this is the great thing you can also use the wi-fi so you could use it as an office or you could just take a shower um also oh. i on f the first friday of every month they have free pizza you know that's pretty dope that's i feel like that's like a big a, a really good tip. Big like going to Planet Fitness. 
Yeah, totally. Uh, but yeah, you know, we try and just keep keep it mellow, so so we can put on a good show. But um, you know, there's every tour. Everybody has what we call my night, which is the night you get kind of wild. wild. Right. <laughs> And you get to like have all the drinks you want and like stay up till 6 a.m. And yeah, but I, I don't know if now that I'm an older lady, I'm not super old, but a little bit older. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to pay the price for my night anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when like your life is touring, right? I mean, like that's how you live. Yeah, we, um, you know, typically we play over a hundred shows a year, especially if we have a new album out. So, um, it's in our best interest, I think, to take care of ourselves, obviously, so you don't yeah. burn out. It. Um, it's, it, it could, it's really easy to burn out on tour if you, if you go too hard every night. Yeah. Um, someone was sort of asking, like, if you, does this same advice sort of pertain to like if you're a band who you're and you're going on your very first tour? <laughs> is there anything different you would say? Um, no, I would no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really lend any different advice. Um, when we went on our first national tour, we only played really house shows, maybe a bar here and there, um, and that was in like two thousand eight or right something like that so it was it was it was a little bit di the world was quite a bit different actually i mean we had to use maps uh none of us had any kind of that we could look things up in so um we just uh had to embrace the the wonders of not knowing Back in which, the day. which is a uh i feel like is a feeling that has been lost and kind of creates a lot of anxiety for people now but um it was super fun you know we we did a lot of stuff um that we don't much have to do anymore because we're not playing as many houses as we used to but we used to go to like the grocery store and just buy rice and beans and just make that you know every day and eat oatmeal every morning and uh stay up after the show to map out like how long our drive would be the next day um so yeah it was it was definitely a different landscape um i I would, I think it was really important learning experience for us and traveling is definitely easier now. So you can mm -hmm. just look up whatever you might need. Yeah. It sounds like maybe like planning, like basically planning your day. Like you don't want to wake up and be like, Oh, we have an eight hour drive and we woke up at noon. Yeah. You but know? now you're like, how long's the drive tomorrow? And no one has to like get a ruler and a map <laughs> and make an educated guess. You can, Right. No how long your drive's gonna be, which That's, is nice. I'm yeah. Not complaining. Uh, but yeah, if you're going out on your first tour, 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 on your first tour, I guess my advice would just be to you know everything in moderation. Uh, be nice to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Wash, wash the dishes at the house that you stay in. That's a good one. Even, even make the bed. If they like, if you if you if they you stay in a bed, you should you should make the bed, even if they're gonna change the sheets. And then like have them over to your house when they're on tour. <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, provide them with all of the desired accoutrements that you might for, totally. for a lovely guest. Um, so while we're on the topic of like first tours and all that, um, I was telling you how like well, I I like to ask this to people because I personally like to know, but I also have this like very lovely image of you as like a tiny little shredder and i want to know like what your first memory of like seeing and playing guitar is um like you know kind of like paint me a photo of like a mini version of you like at 13 or 14. uh I'm trying to I, I mean the first person i ever saw get, play the guitar was my dad um, I was never really super interested in playing the guitar. Um, by the by, the time I was a teenager, I still only really listened to like Hot ninety seven or nice. whatever it was like on like the contemporary hip hop station in in New Jersey. And listening to rock music seemed like this like kind of antiquated, like lame thing. I and I was still really keen on being like popular. 
which I guess I just wasn't, I didn't realize it wasn't going to work out yet, you know? Uh, so, um, my dad told me, um, that he could teach me some guitar chords when I started listening to Nirvana. Um, and Nirvana obviously opened up like a, like a gateway to a bunch of other, other bands and labels that were uh, considerably smaller. And so that's how I got into like, um, all, all of the like grunge bands, but also like Kill Rock Stars and Chainsaw and oh, um, yeah. stuff like that. And, but yeah, you know, the first person I ever saw touch a guitar was definitely my father. Um, but like I said, it's, it was a weird experience because I was like, ah, I got a cool dad, but I don't want to play that thing. <laughs> right. And like, what made you like, at what point were you like, okay, Actually, I do. Like, actually, I'm gonna get really good at this. Um, I guess once I once I started listening to like later, and um, and that there was finally like a mirror to my personal life that I could enjoy, that I was actively enjoying and like really excited about. Then that was when I began to feel like I really wanted to be in a band. I had already started playing guitar, but like I didn't ever think that I could be as good as I needed to be at it. So I could be in a band because I liked bands like Soundgarden and Smashing Pumpkins and, you know, not their musicianship just seemed like bigger, bigger than life. Uh, mm. I, I wasn't sure if I would ever get to that point. And then when I heard a band like Slater Kinney, I was like, these three people are stupendous musicians. They also like kind of seem to have had a similar life experience to me. And I, I think I could also be in a bit really um, focused on, on playing, playing music. Yeah. For, um, I mean, either now or like when you first started, like, do you feel like there was more like confidence in like, was it like I can get on stage because I'm confident in myself or I can get on stage because I'm confident in like my gear and like the instruments that I have? I don't think I ever get on stage feeling like I'm confident in myself. <laughs> I feel like I get on stage feeling like I'm really confident in my band mm -hmm. and like the thing that we made together. Mm -hmm. um, definitely I'm never confident in my gear, even though it has been, um, it has no, it like hasn't been breaking that much lately, which is like probably gonna bite me in the ass tonight. I bet. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not like super invested in gear. I like, I like the stuff that I have, and I've kind of basically stuck with it for the most part for a long time now. Yeah, I like. I mean, not of course not to bring up like your boss chromatic tuner or anything. I was like, <laughs> no, don't mention it, but did send me down this like spiral of like of like doom because you know, you know? <laughs> yeah because like i just like press buttons on that thing until like i get the right setting you know i'm like okay that worked after 10 tries mm -hmm. and then like finally figured out like the strobe versus the single situation it tripped me. <laughs> and then i was like who would ever use the strobe you know yeah. Um, there was one show where I, guess I pushed it, I pushed it without knowing so that everything, uh, the, the standard was a half step down and mm. we were playing in Buffalo and we kept trying to start this song and I was like fully convinced that Mike was just tuning his bass wrong. I was like, Mike, get your act together, man. Come on, pull yourself together. Like I am definitely tuned to this like, you know, E. <laughs> Tune again, and I think we tried to start the song like five times before I realized that my tuner was set as a default to be a half step down, and I was like, "Wow, I'm a presumptuous asshole." <laughs> um, but yeah, that's I mean, tuner talk. We can start like a whole separate podcast. Honestly, like it's true. Like that's the thing that kind of like blew my mind. I was like, "There is so much more to tuners than I thought." We really are, and we're playing with a band. Called, we're on tour with a band called The Owl right now, and you know they play like doom, do me, do me metal for for lack of a better word. I'm not uh, well versed in, in the world of metal, but whenever whenever we um, are a little scared because their music's very scary, 
Um, we just remind ourselves that they're just normal people like us and they all have snark tuners on their guitars. Oh. The snark <laughs> normal people like us. Yeah, in the world in the world of like tuners, the snark is surely the most adorable. Like yeah. you just want, you want to cuddle up next to it. It maybe it's the first thing you want to see when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, it's like the it's a tuner that you you wouldn't mind going out to lunch with, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like you're like, I'll buy you lunch today. <laughs> yeah, you're a good friend. Anyway, um, cool. next week on. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so um, you, okay, you, you guys just released your latest record um, on February 23rd on Don, Don Giovanni Records. Joe, if you're listening, we all love you. Um, but what um, like. It took you guys a, a, a two to three years to like finish that recording and in the process you got sick and spending that much time on a project is in itself like a challenge <laughs> but um and then to finish it is like even more so like congratulations on that so what was like what kind of if you could name like one or one or two things that kind of kept you on track or that like helped you really um shape the sound that you were looking for um, uh, just to clarify, I got sick before Road and Mountain. Okay. So for the two and three years that we were working in between Rose Mountain and, um, all at once, mm -hmm. we were basically just kind of like taking our time because, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of records at this point and, um, I don't, I don't think that there was any real dire reason for us to rush. And so we just took a, a lot of time um, focusing on writing the new songs, but also simultaneously, you know, we, we tour um, for a living basically. So, and we don't really write on tour. So if we're touring, like, no writing is getting done. And the two, the two things happen in very different spaces. So it just, it just took a while cause we were still touring on Rose Mountain and um, we're not super fast songwriters. We write pretty slow. Um, we demo stuff a lot. We do a lot of editing, a lot of back and forth. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, it, you know, we just took our time. There was no reason not to. Right. I, I There's a lot of, like, conversation around, like, you have to keep creating content to, like, this day and age to, like, be successful or whatever, you know, because of all those different platforms. So I feel like it's really uh, reassuring to hear that like, oh yeah, I can like take my time on like creating my child basically. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know like how, how much truth there is to the whole like content thing because in, in real life, uh, like behind the merch table at shows where people actually are, <laughs> you know, uh, they'll sometimes look at our records and be like oh my god you guys have so many records i don't have like this one and this one i've never heard of this one or like people have verbalized to me like i can't even keep up with your your output and it's kind of just like you know then uh, in, in the digital world or whatever you want to call it people are just like jumping at the bit for content so i still feel like the world is in this flux of like deciding what it wants uh -huh. um from from an artist yeah what are you doing? Is this the cat that's a yeah, haunting me? <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> if any of the rest of Screaming Females bandmates wants to chime in, more than happy to have them. Look, Jared's not wearing any pants. <laughs> what? You're allowed to change your pants. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, this is a professional setting. <laughs> We're on tour. Man's got his <laughs> pants. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, um, okay, so some people want to know, um, like before touring, what was a constructive practicing practicing regime for you? Uh, like certain scales, listening by ear, or any other way? <laughs> um, I used to go in my dad's office and put Siamese Dream on in his boom box and then play whatever I wanted over every song. <laughs> and you know what? Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty accurate as to like 
me as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know really anything about scales to be honest. I know I know like what a major scale is and a minor scale is. I know like how like how you know whole step whole step half step or whatever. But uh, for the most part, I just play by ear. And um, when Mike and I were in high school, there was like a an after school <sighs> club called Music Club, very creative, and uh, that's where we uh, with that's where we kind of like became buddies. And um, we you, the moderator was of the club was very into fish, so we were kind of like gently forced into learning how to jam, which. Uh, was a wonderful gift. Um, at the time, I was very angry about it because I was just like, I want to play like Cut Your Hair by Pavement and I don't want to play this lean song. But um, it was a good learning experience. Um, and by the, by senior year, he let me play Cut Your Hair. Well, that's actually my, like, learning, like basically developing your guitar style with your own band or with yourself versus like, oh, I'm going to learn skills to be able to jam. Like, does that um, like make you not want to jam as much or like collaborate with others? Or like, do you feel like your per your vision is pretty much set on like collaborating with those that you already know how to collaborate? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm always down to play with, pretty much anybody who has like some who's making something that uh you know I enjoy personally I just would need I think I would need that 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 other person or people understand that like I'm not a professional musician so like mm -hmm. if I well <laughs> I'm not like a studio musician so if like they sit down and give me a book of sheet music I'm not gonna know what the hell is going on right. um but uh I, I suppose that if I were going to collaborate with other people, I would. My only request is that they are someone who is going to practice uh, some degree of patience with me. Well, uh, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, another question from the audience is: um, What was the worst sleeping situation that has happened on tour? <clears throat> <laughs> well, one time. <laughs> One time we played with this like really cool uh, crusty band from Spain called Cop on Fire. And we were playing at a house in Columbus, Ohio, and we had a really fun show. And then we hung out with them for a while and they were all super sweet and really funny. Um, and this was, you know, this is, I'm not trying to throw shade at them, but they smelled really bad, especially <laughs> it was like super, super hot. And so they got all sweaty and, they all took their shirts off after they played and put them on every single box fan in like the punk house. Uh, and it just like made the smell like permeate every single just inch of the, of every room. It was just like a million degrees, insanely humid. And then just smelled like five really big, very hard rocking, very crusty guys. And so I was, I was trying to find a place to sleep upstairs and I was like, I'm going to like suffocate. This is crazy. It, it was just such an insane smell. So I went into the basement and that's where the cat poops at where cats tend to poop. Right. right. And so it, there was a very strong old beer slash punk slash cat poop smell in that basement as they had been having shows for over a decade. And I found an industrial Sharpie one of the really big ones in my pocket. So I just colored in my whole hand, the entire thing. And then I just put it under my nose and then I fell asleep. Oh my God. <laughs> that was a good one. I'm sure there's more. That was pretty good. I mean, that's not, like you know what? The worst one was when someone was trying to, there was some, there was a person in a band we were all asleep and he was having a hard time. He was, having a hard time. I don't know what was happening. He made some threats. Uh, he threw a snow globe at Jarrett, which they're very big and heavy. And I'm glad the snow globe was fine. I think Jarrett had a bruise. Um, and then we all fell asleep and he decided that it would be cool to sit in the corner of the dark, empty room and rock back and forth and say, I'm going to fucking kill all of you motherfuckers. <laughs> or what seemed like hours, but could have been minutes. Um, 
that was an unpleasant sleeping situation. Damn. Is, that, is that the kind <laughs> of thing where you like, you're like, I can't wait till the morning and then you wake up at 6 a.m. and then you leave? Or do you like pretend like nothing happened? Oh, we definitely had a discussion about it. Um, I think eventually he went outside and threw a bunch of lawn chairs into the street and then passed out in their touring van. Perfect. So once he was out of the once he was out of the room, I mean, I think we all fell back back into a sweet sweet slumber. <laughs> That's great. We really do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we're gonna do two more questions. Um, personally, I, I feel like I've probably asked you this in the past, but I still don't quite get it. Um, is like the the like waist uh, strap. Yeah. I would like to understand it more. Um, basically, after I had um, so I had I had mono for two national tours, and it kind of like ever since it's just my body has had a lot of chronic like neuro pain, just general pain all over. Uh, it was definitely more acute right after I began getting well. Um, but um, I had a lot of pain uh, in like the, what is called like your thoracic outlet where all these like veins go through this tiny passage Thank into you. your arm. And a lot of doctors were like, oh, you know, it's probably your guitar is weighing down on um, on your shoulders. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I only wear it for like, you know, an hour a day max. How could this like, you know, and I have a Strat, it's not like a super heavy guitar. I was like, how can this thing be like cause, causing me so much pain? But then um, after a while, I was just kind of like, uh, I need I need to try wearing my guitar in a different way. So I actually, we had just, I think, yeah, we had just finished making an album with Steve Albini and he kind of infamously wears his guitar around his waist um, in big black and shellac. So I just asked him how he does that. And he just sent me a link to this um, this website called Slinger Straps, and uh, they hooked me up with this waist strap that's just made, you know, for basically redirecting the weight of your guitar in like a more kind of like ergonomic way, where it's not just right completely on your shoulder. So they make other options where like the weight is redistributed so that it's like across both shoulders. It all depends on like what you're struggling with, I guess. Um, but yeah, I I, I use it uh, for that reason. You could also use it because it looks cool, which is why Steve Albini did it. <laughs> right. So you you feel like it has definitely like helped you and relieve some of that pain or some of that stress on your body. I think you know it was definitely a composite of a lot of things in your my body and my brain and uh, and the kind of work that we do. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the waist strap has definitely helped me in in a in navigating my shoulder pain for sure, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna let you choose between these two questions. The first one is, um, if you could hang out with any animal, living or extinct, what would it be? Or you could answer the question of, um, what do you think about age as a musician? About about what? Age and how that affects you as a musician. You already can answer both, up to you. Um. All right, well, I'm gonna pick the animal one just because this morning I got to pet a goat um, <laughs> and it was really nice. I, she was like, I think, I don't know like a lot about goats, but maybe the horns were coming in or they were shedding or something was happening, but she needed a lot of head scratches. So I, I had her back or her head, whatever. And, but I have really been wanting like one of these like miniature donkeys. Oh my God. Um, so if I had to hang out with any animal, Oh, living or extinct or, or still with us, it would definitely, I, I really would like to have like a very small donkey and just be that local lady with them. Um, yeah. The lady with the donkey. Like I'm, I want to be that, that person. I feel it. So do you, I don't know if, um, like, do you know Shannon Shaw from Shannon the Clamps? Um, not personally, but I am a fan. Well, I don't know if she's listening or if anyone will understand this, but it relates to what you just said because on her like Facebook, she just like posts like videos of cute tiny animals. Mm -hmm. And like <laughs> I've decided that if like I could hang out with any animal, it would be like one of those miniature lambs. 
that like runs around and like falls asleep immediately. Yeah, I mean, any like very small ungulate is something that I want to hang out with. I know it's yeah. and put a tiny sweater on. <laughs> Agreed. Um, okay, cool. Well, I really appreciate your time, and this was really great. Um, Thank you for having me. And uh, you know, have a good good tour. And yeah. then you're gonna be playing in Portland, Maine tonight. And where exactly? Tonight we're in Portland, Maine at Space Gallery. I think there are tickets left, but I'm not sure. So, know before you go. Okay, cool. And then check out like Screaming Females website for the rest of the tour yeah Thanks, all right Mom. cool bye marissa bye y'all